So as Simon said, um, I have the privilege of continuing our Hillel series that we've been working through at the moment, what, answering the question, what is the Holy Spirit saying to us as a church? And as Simon said a few weeks ago, we as leaders definitely do not have the monopoly on answering this question. Um, we're just seeking to unpack it together. Um, and even more so today, I would just say that today feels like a very team curated message. And again, it feels like just the beginning. It feels like the tip of the iceberg, actually. But very much I have gleaned, benefited from the voices of many, many friends within YTC and outside as I've yeah, wrestled with this topic for today. So it's team. Let's dive into it together. Let's just pray one more time. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us? What are you saying to us? We, we claim, well, we, we, we pray with the verse in the Old Testament that Samuel prays and encourages Eli to pray the other way around. Eli encourages Samuel to pray, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And actually that is our prayer as well. It's a beautiful prayer of surrender, of abandon to God. Yeah, we want to say speak, Lord, because we're listening. We're tuning our ear towards you. We love your voice. We love your voice. Amen. Yes. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says these beautiful words. It's right after his resurrection. It's called the Great Commission. Again, if you're not familiar with it, the Great Commission is really just the sending statement of Jesus to his disciples, but and that cascades down into us generations later. He says these words. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded of you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Beautiful, beautiful words of Jesus there. And today, like I shared at the beginning, and you might have read in the notices, we are looking at how three practices that we may be familiar with if we've been in church for a while work together. So that is worship, prayer, and mission. Now, I don't know about you, when I started to think about this, I, my mind started to think that actually in church, perhaps in recent history, we have become quite good at separating those three practices out. So you will hear us talk about worship meetings. I mean, you heard us talk about that already today with the increase in the garden, or prayer meetings, or evangelistic events that we'd like to encourage you to invite your friends to see their practices or even with people we might refer to somebody as a worship leader or they're an amazing prayer drummer is a great intercessor or they're a great evangelist they're so gifted in speaking to people who don't know jesus yet about him and actually i started to think and i read some books that backed up this thinking perhaps those things can work really well together. Those practices are combined. And then even more than that, perhaps God has intentionally designed them to work beautifully together. They work best when they're interlinked. It's like Simon, when he shared with us a few weeks ago, that picture of the Trinity. Do you remember? He talks about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit being in beautiful unity and it almost being like a dance. That's the the picture that we have of them, that they're weaving and they're, I don't know what the words are, they're, they're making beautiful dancing gestures together. They're, they're, they're in unison with each other. They're in community with each other. And we, as God's children and as his friends, were invited into that. And I wonder if it's similar here that actually in the practices of worship, prayer and evangelism, which we have separated a little bit in church history, even in this church, maybe they're meant to be together. 
So that's what we're going to dive into this morning. And I want to start by sharing with you a very recent testimony. This is something that I feel God has been laying in my heart like very recently. It's only been in the last couple of months that I've started to think and waken up to this truth I've just said. Um, so I wanted to share with you a bit of a testimony and then we're going to dive into a bit more. So as some of you will know already, we have had the privilege of welcoming many new people to YCC over the last year. Um, in November, four girls from YWAM decided to make YCC their home. So they moved from London, from um, a base, a YWAM base in London, to continue the YWAM base in York. The previous leader went back to America and they were sent up to continue. Um, and amazingly, and they decided to make YCC their home. So they started worshipping with us just before Christmas. And some of you will have met some or all of the girls at various things. They've been at ladies' breakfast, social training yesterday, at youth work, Kairos. And it's amazing, actually, how they've very quickly just embedded into the life of YCC. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what they do. So YWAM stands for Youth Wish with a Mission. As I said, there's already been a YWAM base in York for quite a few years. Um, and they are the, the next manifestations of leaders of that. Um, their weekly rhythm looks quite different, and those four girls have a particular creative arts flavour to the base. That's what they carry. They're amazing dancers, artists, photographers, musicians themselves. So that's the kind of flavour of, of the work that they're establishing here. And already in lockdown, this is what amazes me, when we've been so restricted, they've still been able to establish and start quite a lot of key stuff in our city. So um, recently, a few of the girls led a holiday club from their base on the Barnabas Centre. Um, there's dance classes, creative writing workshops they've started, and as well, um, a real desire to tie into the unity movements in the city. So a couple of them come to, to One Voice York, which as you may know is the weekly meeting for church leaders together. Um, and a few of them come to Unite, which is the youth worker version of that. Um, it's just brilliant. And again, I've had the privilege of, of getting to know them, but of calling them my friends. And actually, they have shaped and challenged me <laughs> in recent months. I felt convicted by the Holy Spirit about two months ago and um, off the back of something I saw in them what they do. One of their weekly rhythms, as well as all of this, is that they go out on the streets of York and they tell, seek to tell, seek to build relationship with the inhabitants of our city. They seek to tell people about Jesus and about just how much God loves them. So, so that's something that they do every week, every Saturday afternoon. They're at the Belfry. Um, and I felt convicted. There was already an open invitation at One Voice. You know, anybody that wants to any church that wants to partner with us, come along. I was like, gosh, these amazing girls are in our church. I should probably join with them and learn from them and actually fight my fear because that kind of evangelism scares me, honestly. <laughs> it, it makes me very nervous. But actually, I was feeling a real God prompt that this might be a good thing for me to stretch my spiritual muscles and that actually I could learn from the girls in by doing it with them. So... I was already thinking that Friday, Saturday um, of this particular weekend. And then I came to church that Sunday. As, as you know, we've started our rhythm of doing Kairos every two weeks. And it was a Kairos Sunday, like it is today, actually. Um, and I was helping with our, our young children. I was in my key issue group. And we were talking about <coughs> the that idea of evangelism and actually how... Yeah, we're just encouraging the children, actually, to think missionally. Um, to be aware of how God was using them in their school, in their friendship group. Um, and that just really resonated with me, I think, because of where my head was at already. I was thinking these thoughts, I was feeling convicted, feeling the Holy Spirit stirring me up a little bit. And then this was the topic that we we're doing with the kids, and I just thought, okay, God, two things. I'm going to respond to what I think is, is you speaking to me. So it was actually really funny. Back in that Sunday, I remember standing in Burnham Car Park after everybody left and I just sent one of the girls a message and said, next Saturday, I'm going to commit to coming out with you on the streets. Because I knew that if I texted her, I would be less likely to back out. <laughs> so um, six days later, um, I, I went and I met the girls. Classic Britain, it was chucking it down with rain all day. 
I mean, I hate to be very classically British and talk about the weather, but hasn't May just been such a washout? And this Saturday was one of those days. So I met them in their base and we prayed and worshiped together first. That's something they love to do to prepare their hearts and prepare the ground. Then we walked and stand together, had my guitar, raining, 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 raining all the time. We're walking in faith that it'd be dry enough to, I can't, I, I think I can't even play my guitar if it's raining. So, um, and we had a, a few portable arms with us. Amazingly, for the hour and a half that we were out on the streets in front of the Belfry, in fact, we've got a picture actually of it. Here we are. Um, you can see the clouds in the background. For the 90 minutes that we were worshipping, it stopped raining. <laughs> And that was just, yeah, an example to me of the kindness of God and his blessing of our, our courage and my very, very little faith in doing this. So, um, yes, what we did was um, I joined with the girls. I joined with what they do, had established already. Um, this is Deborah and me. We worship together. And then the three other girls um, were just striking up really natural conversations with the inhabitants that stopped, with the people that listened. And even though it had been raining, there were people out. And it was honestly so beautiful. I felt so humbled, so encouraged, so inspired by, of course, God and his work through me in the setting, but also just looking at what the girls were doing. They're, they're very established in this stuff and just thought, this is so beautiful. There was no opposition. Nobody saying, don't talk to me. It was just so natural and so beautiful. Probably helped. They had their American charm on buds. It was just beautiful. And actually, that is kind of the testimony I've had in my head as I prepared for today. And so, I've, yeah, I've been out with them quite a few times more since then. And I'm going to commit to doing that every few weeks with them because I think it's really good for me. And also, it feels like really good stewardship of our city, you know, looking after our city. We're worshipping, we're changing the atmosphere, and we're seeking to tell people about the love of God, that, that he loves them so much. Deborah, when we sing together, she will say down the microphone to the crowds just how much God loves them I just want people to hear that time and time again so that's the place I wanted to start with I thought it was very helpful and I thought it would be helpful for us to quickly remind ourselves what those three words worship prayer and evangelism mean so we'll pop up the next slide Sarah so worship is simply the idea of giving worth to something or someone the, pic the picture for us biblically is um, Mary anointing Jesus' feet, and she is cracking and pouring this incredibly expensive jar of oil, which was enough for what I use wages, over Jesus' feet. That's what we do when we worship him through song and actually with our lives. It's both we're giving worth to him, to the one who saved us and loves us. Praying, simply having a conversation with God is that simple. And I'd say I would say, Becky and I are really biased on this with youth, with young people. When we're speaking about prayer, we just encourage, yes, you can speak to him about anything. The Psalms show us that. But listen to him as well. It's a two-way conversation. God is alive and he wants to speak back to you. So it's a conversation with God. And mission or evangelism, as you'll hear me say sometimes today, is simply telling other people who don't know it yet about God's love. As I read at the beginning, the Great Commission, Jesus says, go. In my Bible, there's an exclamation mark after it. I love that Our urgency, that encouragement, go and make disciples. Simon talks often about disciple and making disciples. That's his vision as a pastor. He wants to encourage fruitful disciples who then make disciples, who make disciples, and it goes on and goes on and goes on and multiplies. So that's what those three words work. Three words mean I want to say as well, there's, I think I can say this on behalf of the YWAM girls, there's an open invitation to join with them any Saturday afternoon that you may want to. So they are there outside the, the Belfry every Saturday from about 2.30. And I know that they would love anybody to join with them if you too want to stretch your spiritual muscles and, and do this. It is scary, but it, it's, I can testify it's, it's amazing. But I also want to talk about how mission is a way of life. It is doing those things, those one-off events, which are amazing, but it's a way of life. And what I'm going to speak about now is how those three things work so beautifully together. So I saw that, so to say, a direct manifestation of how those three principles 
beautifully dance together. So we were worshipping, me and Deborah were worshipping, but we were praying all the time. And with those two things, when I reflect on it, what we're doing, we were getting our hearts in line with God, both beforehand, but continually through it as well. Because that's what worship and prayer is. We're giving worth to our creator, and we're speaking to him. And so our hearts are aligned with his. And actually, it's such a privilege, because when we do that, <laughs> I, I have experienced this quite a lot. God wants to share things with us, and that is just such a privilege. It says God, God trusts, he confides in those who fear him. I'm speaking about us. What an incredible thing, isn't it? We're very aware of our brokenness and our smallness, in a sense. But God, the creator of the world, wants to share things with us. That's just mind-blowing when we sit and think about that for a long time. But then... Those two things, hearts aligned through worship and prayer, fit so beautifully with mission because when we have the heart of God shared with us, God shares the things that he cares about with us. He shares things about the world, about mission, about his desire for this broken world to know his love and his holiness. That that's who he is, isn't it? Worship, prayer, and mission, the three work so beautifully together. The things that God shares, often, for the sake of the world, see this broken world fixed, and we get to partner in that. Like I said, mission is a way of life, and anti that principle, I'm gonna just unpack it a little bit. I want us to think now about how those three things work in our lifestyles. It's a, like a reframing of our attitudes. It is also the one of like evangelism on the streets every Saturday, it is that. But it's also every day, every day. One of the girls said to me actually, I'm just as much an evangelist as when I walk into the market on a Monday or a Tuesday, because she's looking with a God perspective on the situation. And that's really what I want to encourage us into for the second half. Worship, like I said, is giving worth to the one who made us. And I just want to say like that's, it is singing songs. But as I said, it's our way of life. And it could be reading psalms. It could be even just prayers of exclamation of how much you love God. That's what it simply is, giving worth to him. And prayer, communing with him regularly. Simon taught us a lot about this, hasn't he? That we want to do that more and more. Yeah. We attach prayer to the everyday tasks that we do that can be a really helpful thing like i know simon said to us before when he boils the kettle he speaks to god <laughs> when he climbs up the stairs he speaks to god for me it's when i'm on my bike when i hop on my bike i just think okay i'm going to talk to god because i've attached prayer to that mundane activity and it works really well or when i was working in school and that's a challenging environment school teachers because it's a real battle over our thought spaces. There is so much stuff coming at us all the time. I would find us, as a music teacher, crazy busy all day, I would sneak into our cupboard where we kept our resources at lunchtime, and I would have literally 30 seconds of just realigning, of centering myself on God again, and talking to him and being like, you're here, you're here. Use me, <laughs> have your way. And let me see things with your perspective. That's the real thing I want to encourage us in YTC is seeing with a God lens, reframing our attitude so that every day, the mission is every day, <laughs> that we're asking God all the time, God, what are you wanting to do here? Who are you wanting to bless? What are you wanting me to do? What are you wanting to say? It's that. It's that. And I reckon as we start to see these everyday situations with more of a God awareness, we grow as our hearts are aligned more and more with him. And I just think we will see more of that thing that we cry out for all the time. Heaven coming to earth. Heaven coming to earth. It is a big prayer that we pray all the time. But it's also little actions all the time. It's reframing. It's viewing things with this perspective. And one other thing that I have been thinking about recently that I think is a kingdom principle. So I think this is a kingdom principle, if I coin it as that. Worship, prayer, and a mission, how they work together. They're designed to be together, actually, perhaps. 
Another thing I've been thinking of is what well, Simon referenced at the beginning of the service, which also, if you know him, he talks about all the time. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. In fact, I've got on a slide here, Psalm 100. And actually, just in case you didn't realize this, that is what we try and do strategically in lots of different situations. So we encourage our worship team to start in that place. As Simon said, let's start by looking at God and remembering him before we then move into lamenting or confessing and thinking about ourselves, which are important things to do too. But let's start with praise at the beginning, getting our hearts aligned with his, remembering who he is because he's perfect. And then that's the, sorry, sorry, that's the other promises, the verse underneath just there. God inhabits the praises of his people. As we celebrate him, as we start with praise, he can't help but join in. <laughs> I think that's that's the bit of, that's what I know of God so far. In my 11 years of walking with him, he can't help but join in with that sound. It's pleasing to him. So that principle is one that we actually replicate in loads of different settings. We start our services in that way, our worship meetings in that way. And actually more recently, I've been thinking prayer meetings should start in that way too. If you come to Cornerstone Envisaging, that's how we start. Whether it's sung worship or it's through reading Psalms, as Mike did a few weeks ago with us, it's starting with praise, aligning our hearts with him before we then come to him with lots of stuff to intercede for. It's just such a good model. And then I saw, when I went out with the YWAM girls, that this can be an evangelistic thing as well. This blew my mind when I realized it. So one of the team, when she's striking up conversation, because I'm worshipping or watching, she'll always start by complimenting somebody on their dress sense. So like a stranger, that's her way in. It's like, oh, I love what you're wearing. So for example, the other week, there was a, a tourist who was wearing a shoulderless top. And that was her, her starting point. I love your top. I saw her body gesture. Or it could be a child's outfit. Maybe they're dressed up as a fairy. And it's genuine. That's the other thing. It's not like faking it. She genuinely really cares about people's aesthetic and what they're wearing. And I was just speaking to a friend about this last week. I'm thinking, gosh, maybe that's the same principle. Starting with thanksgiving and adoration, it catches the attention of God. Because what she's doing in that moment, evangelistically, missionally, is celebrating another one of his children. And we reckon that God loves them. That he can't help but join in with that. That he inhabits that praise. Whoa. I, like I said, I, I still haven't got the full meat of that. But it's just something that this week I've been a bit floored by. Like, wow, God, I think that's who you are. I think that's how you work. So I just wanted to share that with us, my Susie. And that, let's say in that more, maybe there's more that God has for us there. So starting with praise is such a good place in loads of settings in worship, in prayer, in mission. Those three things together. And it works so beautifully missionally, doesn't it? In those wonderful events in our lives, day to day, reframing our thinking, just being God aware. We're giving worth to our creator, we're worshiping him. We're starting with celebration. And then in prayer, we're in constant communication with him through the day, through the day. So it's a real encouragement I felt as I was preparing. Let's, let's protect and encourage the growth of those disciplines in our life. Again, hear me very loud and clear. Right to see, this is not a message of condemnation. Like, you've not been worshipping enough, you need to do that more. Or, you've not been praying enough, you need to do that more. Or, you need to get out on the streets and talk to your non-Christian colleagues about Jesus more. That's not it. We know that our salvation is through the gift of Jesus. Yeah, we're justified by his faith, by faith in his sacrifice. So there's no amount of soul saved <laughs> that's going to buy our place in heaven. That's, that's not it. That's not it. Hear me loud and clear on that. But it is reframing our thinking so that mission is every day. It's that go and make disciples. And actually, the, in the Great Commission, there's a promise, isn't there, that God is with us. Surely until the end of the age, he's always with us. Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your prisons? So as we start to grow and cultivate these things in our life, we have that amazing promise that he's loving that decision, I think, but helping us with that. He's with us all the time. 
so we can be brave to do things that scare us because our Father God isn't going to let us down. So I just really want to encourage us, YCC, let's reframe our thinking. Let's think missionally as a lifestyle beautifully combined with giving worth to our Father God and cultivating that, protecting that in our lives and speaking to and communing with him all the time. As I finish up, I just wanted to share one anecdote that I was thinking of. So many of you will know that I'm married to Mark, who is a massive fan of sourdough baking. So the story is that four years ago, I bought him a book called Brilliant Bread by James Martin. Not sure if I can advertise that actually online, but recommend it. Um, and it was the best present, seconds to the roses. I got him last year. He's obsessed with them as well. The best present I bought him ever because, as my friends will testify to you, if you meet Mark and get to know him better, he can't help by telling you about his sourdough, showing you pictures, or even, in Eliza and Becky's case, and Lois's case, giving you some of his sourdough starter. <laughs> and there's a picture, thank you, Sarah, of one of his beautiful creations. It's one of the best. And it just made me think, when I was preparing for this, I was thinking about him and his love of sourdough. <clears throat> when you love something or someone, you can't help but tell other people about it, right? When you love somebody or something, you can't help but tell others about it. And I thought about that in a spiritual context for us. We know the love of God and we're growing in it more and more and more. I think this stuff flows out of us really naturally. So it's an encouragement to sit in, to rest in, to cultivate the love of God, to really know in our lives, to pour out of us for other people. And this is the landing verse, the vine and the branches again. And this is what I shared two weeks ago. And actually Simon referenced this concept last week as well, which is a beautiful, uniting thing in our otherwise quite random Holy Spirit series. It's abiding in, resting in, cleaving in the love of God. And that being our motivation, that being our starting place, that being our first foundation. So the vine and the branches, I'm sure you know it. Thank you, Sarah. It says this, God says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And that is the place that I want us to land today. Remaining in him and in that beautiful promise. Did you see that? That we, re we rest in him and there's a promise that fruit will come. So our job actually is to know more and more of his love, to stay in that place. Yes, to reframe my thinking, to watch what God is doing, but to do that like in conversation with him. God, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to speak to at work? Who do you want me to pray with even? I love praying for non-Christians. So that's where I want us to land today. So I'm going to hand back to Becky and Eliza. We're going to worship together. Um, yeah, let me pray for us. Yeah, Father God, we thank you so much for your love. Thank you that you are the vine and we are your branches and we want to rest in you. And I thank you for that promise and that beautiful verse that actually when we rest in you, fruitfulness is the, is the promise. Fruitfulness comes. Grapes will grow on the vineyards when we're raining, when we're remaining, when we're cleaved into you. So we want to rest in that place. And I want to pray for our every day for our thinking to be start to reframe it that we will start to think what is god wanting me to do here or who does he want me to speak to you we start to ask you these kind of questions so that our every day is transformed into a missional opportunity and again not because of guilt or condemnation but because we love you so much and we want other people to know about the amazing love you have for us yeah, so, so just continue to speak to us, Holy Spirit. We've just started. I think we've just started. But we say we love you and we want to know your love more. Amen.